When were the Gospels written? Were they written in the lifetime of eyewitnesses or maybe, maybe much, much later than that? And depending on when they were written, can we start to crack away at the reliability of the New Testament, therefore cracking away at the reliability of Jesus, therefore cracking away at the trustworthiness of Jesus as God's Son and Messiah and Prophet and everything else? Well, those are all the questions that are at the heartbeat of modern debates over when the Gospels were written. And uh, as I've said, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to do more and more radio debates on the Sin Boldly Radio program, and I've got a doozy for you today. Welcome to the Sin Boldly Radio program uh, here at KPFT. If you're listening uh, online, we're so glad that you're with us on the HD3 channel. This is the Sin Boldly Ro- Radio program. If you're, if you're listening via the podcast, please check out kpft.org. This is community radio. We will have no commercial breaks. Uh, we get to talk uh, straight through for an hour and maybe a few minutes past. And uh, so do go to kpft.org and learn how you can support community radio here in Houston. And uh, I'm Evan McClanahan. I'm the pastor over at First Evangelical Lutheran Church. I have a love for this kind of uh, debate and conversation. And uh, so I'm very lucky to be able to have this debate today. We, Our guest will be on the phone with us, so I don't have a phone line available uh, for you to call in. Uh, our guests have a, a fairly strict uh, format. Uh, with some flexibility, so they're going to present uh, their arguments uh, for for each other and then have time for questions for me and questions for one another. Uh, so let me introduce, first of all, the topic and then our guests, and then I say we just dive in. But essentially, we're going to cover two topics today. The, the first topic is, when were the Gospels written? Uh, in essence, are we uh, were they written in the 50s, 60s, within a generation of Jesus, or were they written... In the 70s, 80s, 90s, maybe even beyond. So that is topic number one. Topic number two is how does the dating of the Gospels affect their historical reliability? And we're going to have some back and forth, like I said, on both of those questions. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, With me today in studio uh, is Dr. Craig Evans. Dr. Evans is uh, one of the foremost scholars alive today in the study of the historical Jesus, focusing especially on his death and resurrection. Uh, Evans has lectured at several prominent universities and seminaries around the world, including Cambridge, Durham, Oxford in the United Kingdom, Princeton and Yale here in the States, and Hebrew University and Ben-Gurion University in Israel. He's appeared on hundreds of television and radio media, and now we can add one more to the list, the Sin Boldly radio program here at KPFT. And uh, on the phone uh, with us is Matthew Ferguson. Matthew is a Ph.D. graduate student in classics at the University of California, Irvine. His research interests include ancient biography, Greek and Latin historiography, the New Testament, early Christianity, and the early Roman Empire. He also uh, studies epistemology and metaphysics, and uh, philosophy is his, part of his graduate work as well. He completed his master's in classics at the University of Arizona, with a master's thesis studying the use of ring composition in Suetonius's De Vita Caesarum. I probably said that all wrong, but Matthew will be able to correct me. And finally, Matthew is also an advocate for secular humanism, naturalist philosophy, church-state secularism, and writes about these issues on uh, his other blog, Civitas Humana. And uh, before we go, I want each of you to have plenty of opportunity to tell people where your websites are so that they can learn more. But we've got the topics. We've got a format. Uh, each speaker on each topic is going to have six minutes. Uh, Matthew's going to go first, and then we're going to have about 10 to 12 minutes uh, for s- questions for me and then questions for one another. And uh, can everyone hear each other, and is everyone ready to go? Yep, ready to go. Thank you, Evan. I'm ready to go, Evan. All right, good deal. Well, Matthew, I'm going to start the timer. You've got six minutes to answer the question of when were the Gospels written. Go ahead. All right. To begin, I would like to thank Reverend McClanahan uh, for inviting me to participate in this debate, as well as Dr. Evans for joining us. The first topic of today's discussion is when were the canonical Gospels written. In contemporary scholarship, the dates that are proposed span from about 40 to 130 CE, Common Era. Most scholars agree upon a more narrow date range from roughly 65 CE to the early 2nd century. I personally am not rigid on the issue of dating, since I think it is difficult to know precise years, but I think it is possible that Luke Acts, as well as John and even Matthew, could have been as written as late as after 100 CE, all three in the 2nd century. 
even if earlier dates are also possible. But furthermore, I'll offer some arguments today for why I think the Gospel of Mark is written at least after 70 CE, the year of the Jewish Temple's destruction in Jerusalem. So let's get started. To answer this question, I think the best approach is to start backwards, looking at the later pieces of evidence which establish the terminus ante quem for a text. That's a Latin term meaning the latest possible date. We can start by looking at external quotations of the Gospel. You start to see possible quotations of the Gospels in the Patristic Church Fathers by the early 2nd century. The earliest of these references, however, are disputably not interacting with written text. Letters of Ignatius and Polycarp, for example, quote similar verses and phrases shared with the Gospels. But these similarities may come from oral tradition and not the text themselves. By the time you get to Justin Martyr, however, who dates from 150 to 160 CE, you start to see clear interaction with the Gospels as written texts. Justin refers to the Gospels as memoirs of the Apostles, and he says that these texts were drawn up and written, meaning they were completed works. Before Justin, fragments of the lost church father Papias may also provide evidence for the dating of Matthew and Mark. Papias dates to around 110 to 140 CE, and he refers to texts allegedly written by Matthew and Mark. Papias does not quote any verses from them, so we don't know if he is referring to the Gospels that we have today. But if Papias is referring to the text of Matthew and Mark, which is possible, that might set an upper date limit in the first couple decades of the first century. Next piece of evidence to look at are internal clues within the text themselves. Uh, this kind of evidence, however, can pose many challenges. Uh, for one, it would be nice if the Gospel authors told us when they had written. Uh, the Greek historian Dionysius of Halicarnassus, for example, tells us in the preface of his Roman history that he wrote from 30 to, se- uh, to 7 BCE. Uh, that is very useful information to have, uh, but the Gospels do not provide any information like this. Um, instead, the internal evidence of the Gospels is more ambiguous, um, which is partly why I think the external evidence should be favored when dating, giving date ranges. But I also think there is evidence for saying the Gospel of Mark after 70 CE, uh, following the destruction of the Jewish Temple in Jerusalem and during the reign of the Emperor Vespasian. Uh, most scholars also argue that Mark was written first, and then Matthew and Luke used Mark. Uh, this view is called Mark in priority, and I believe that Dr. Evans holds it as well. If not, I'm happy to discuss it further in the Q&A. I also think there is evidence that John was familiar with Mark and also Luke. Uh, for the rest of this, uh, this discussion, however, I'm going to discuss why I think Mark is written post-70 CE. In Mark chapter 13, the author refers to the destruction of the Jewish temple and signs of the end times. The author states, not one stone here will be left on another, everyone will be thrown down. But many scholars have questioned, however, is whether Mark is only anticipating the destruction of the temple during perhaps the early stages of the Jewish War, around 66 CE, or whether Mark has specific knowledge of the temple's destruction and is referring to it as a completed event. I think there are strong narrative clues to indicate that Mark is writing about the temple's destruction as a completed event. And to demonstrate this, I'll be using some of the recent arguments advanced by Adam Wynn, and the purpose of Mark's Gospel, who argued that Mark was written in response to the propaganda of the Roman Emperor Vespasian. To understand the Mark reference to this temple destruction, you also have to look at the surrounding narrative in chapters 11 through 12. In these chapters, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, and there are a number of anti-temple motifs. Uh, for one, there is the cursing of the fig tree in chapter 11. What is interesting about this event is that it is sandwiched around Jesus driving out the money chamber, changers in the temple courts, Jesus curses the fig tree, then he clears the temple court, and after that, the fig tree is shown to be withered. Physical scholars realize that these two events are paired together. The fig tree is a metaphor for the temple's withering. Likewise, there is the parable of the wicked tenants in Mark 12. In the parable, a group of farmers mismanage a vineyard that has been lent to them by a landlord, and it states that the landlord will return to punish them and give the vineyard to another the chapter also states that the parable directed the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and thus the parable serves as an indictment of the temple authorities. It is after this symbolism in the preceding chapter that Jesus then makes the prediction that every stone will be thrown down. Now, what is interesting about the anti-temple motif in Mark is that it is not found in earlier Christian texts. The Apostle Paul, for example, who writes before the temple destruction during the 50s and 60s CE, makes no indictment against the temple in his undisputed letters nor an Acts. Instead, strong anti-temple themes in Christian literature first appear in Mark. Likewise, it's important to remember the political context of the temple's destruction. Following the Jewish War, the Roman Emperor Vespasian held a triumph in Rome parading the temple's captured ornament, which can still be seen on the Arch of Titus today. Vespasian was also said to perform miracles when he became emperor, such as curing a blind man at Alexandria by spitting in his eyes. 
What is interesting is that Mark also depicts Jesus curing the blind man at Bethsaida in Mark 8 using his saliva. Scholar Eric Eve argues that this, this passage is likely a reference to the Spasian's miracle and is depicting Jesus as a rival to the Flavian Emperor. Uh, this miracle is also only found in Mark, and the other Gospels do not depict Jesus using saliva, for example, to cure people. It is not unreasonable to think, therefore, that if the Spasian's destruction of the temple and the curing of the blind was widely known, the author of Mark may have been responding to this propaganda as gospel in a setting of a place then after 70 CE. That said, I also think the matter of dating is complicated. It depends greatly on interpretation. I'm open to earlier dates of composition, but I think we should treat the date ranges with caution and acknowledge later dates spanning as late as 100 to 130 CE as the outer range that needs to be set to dating the gospel. That said, I now look forward to Dr. Evans' own discussion. All right, good deal. And as mentioned, you went a few seconds over six minutes, so uh, we'll give Dr. Evans a few seconds over six minutes as well, if you would like. And uh, Dr. Evans, are you, uh, are you ready to answer the same question, when were the Gospels written? Uh, yes, uh, right. and Matthew, I commend you for your succinctness. You covered the ground very, very well. Good job. You've done your homework. Uh, in my view, uh, that was a very fair treatment of the range. Uh, the outer limit, I would never go quite that far, uh, 120, 130, something like that, because it doesn't take into a, uh, it doesn't allow for the development and cir- the circulation of the Gospels that would lead to the development of a widespread view of them as authoritative. I think you have to allow for some years. That's why I would uh, keep uh, the canonicals, certainly the synoptics, in the first century. Uh, and perhaps even John, somewhere in the 90s, perhaps near the end of the first century. But let me uh, chase right away to the point that you made about the uh, uh, temple destruction. And, of course, you were right to focus on that. Uh, the vagueness of the details uh, or the fixation on the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem uh, clearly points to something in the late 60s, early 70s. I myself have wavered on that. At one time, I dated Mark at 71, something like that. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, later, uh, getting more deeply in other related literature, other Jewish predictions uh, of the destruction of the temple, including uh, at Qumran, I realized, you know what, there were a lot of people worried about the fate of the temple while it was still standing. And so uh, unless we want to somehow argue that everything that anticipated the temple's destruction has to be post-70, what we call prophecies after the event, Vaticania ex eventu, I think that begins to to beg the question a little bit. So there were people who predicted things. Some of the things they predicted were simply wrong. Josephus tells us about a fellow named Thutis who predicted that the Jordan River would be parted. He tells us about somebody, uh, a Jew from Egypt up on the Mount of Olives, who predicted that the walls of Jerusalem would fall down. And so people made predictions, and sometimes they were simply wrong. So I, here's the thing that, til, for me, tilts it toward prior to 70, in the case of Mark, the earliest of the three synoptics. And that's because the uh, the details are rather vague. You cited not one stone upon another. That's good. That's right out of the Old Testament. Josephus talks about the fire and makes a, a lot out of that, the fiery destruction. I counted up. Uh, at least 10 or 12 times in the destruction of the temple. He talks about fire, yet Jesus doesn't say that. And I find that very interesting. So he uses uh, kind of a blasé stereotype out of the Old Testament, and then no details that actually match specific details of the destruction. In fact, we're not sure that how long it took before the stones were thrown down. I was in Israel last June talking to archaeologists about that. There's a pile of stones that probably came from, uh, if not the temple itself, some of the supporting buildings. <clears throat> and we're not sure if those stones were thrown off the top of the Temple Mount in the year 71 or 2. It, they may have collapsed in a much later earthquake. It's an interesting question. So Jesus is using some very common uh, Old Testament language and not talking about the fire, which is so emphasized by Josephus because he makes a theology out of it. So it's this lack of 
of uh, reflecting specific details that make me wonder, maybe it really is one more prediction among several that are prior to 70. The other interesting thing, too, scholars have trouble dating undated literature because unlike documentary literature that usually has dates, literature, you know, who knows, even the paleography, the dating, the handwriting is tough because after all, we have copies of copies and very, very seldom do we have an autograph, the original copy of a writing from antiquity. James Crossley, who is an atheist, by the way, a British scholar, and I know James, we're on an editorial board together for a journal. He dates Mark to the late 30s, early 40s, because what he finds in Mark matches closely the way the Jewish law really was understood in the 30s. And that raises an interesting question about verisimilitude, which I'll talk about in the second topic. So I, I, I conclude by saying, you know, Matthew's a survey of, of the arguments and the range of dates, I think it was a good survey. Lots of scholars come down in various places there. I tilt toward pre-70 for Mark. I'm even open to the possibility of Mark being in the 50s simply because uh, it, its focus on the the collapse of the Roman Empire, or the, the imperial system, Caesar as a son of God, could well reflect Nero and his own eclipse and demise. So we could be in the late 50s, we could be in the early to middle 60s, but the destruction of Jerusalem just sounds stereotypical and it doesn't sound like uh, the specifics. One other little point, Jesus says, pray that it not happen in winter. Well, it happens in summer. That's an odd uh, element to add to the story. If writing after 70, one knows that, in fact, winter did not play any role at all. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay, it's amazing always how time flies. So six minutes each there. Now we're going to have about 10 or 12 minutes. Uh, Give me a second here. I'm going to set my timer. Uh, I'll go ahead and put it at 12 minutes since we're we're doing fine on time, and I'll get started. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, Each of you will have... uh, Let's say, uh, how do we say, about one to two minutes to answer, and Matthew, you'll go first when your answer. Um, I figured the temple would be uh, a big deal, and, uh, you know, I mean, because that is really the turning point, uh, the year 70, uh, with a lot of these, a lot of the dates, either way. Um, we, you mentioned already, though, in Mark, I'm, I'm wondering if each of you could comment on how you could tell, theoretically, or give examples, but how could you tell... Uh, anything about the temple's destruction from, I would say, Luke or Matthew, but you could also include John. I don't think John is in dispute as being after 70. Um, But for those who might want to date Matthew and Luke before 70, are there clues regarding the temple in Matthew and Luke uh, that would indicate either that the temple is gone or that the temple is still there? So what what say you on that, Matthew? A couple minutes. Okay, well, first... uh if we assume Mark in priority, Matthew and uh, Luke must have come afterwards, but let's not assume that. So Luke, I think there might be evidence that he's familiar with the writings of Josephus, and Steve Mason and Richard Perbo have argued this. Uh, if that's the case, that would put him after 94 CE, so we can use that. Um, the removal of the stones is likewise mentioned uh, in Matthew. I'm not sure, uh, you know, I think the best argument is that he's using Mark, um, but... And you'd have to get into a hypothesis that posited my sign priority to argue otherwise. Uh, we can go down that route, but that would be my answer for where the temple is in those two texts. Okay. Dr. Evans, any thoughts on... Well, that's a that's really a good approach to take, and uh, so let me let's say something about Luke and Acts together. Yes, Richard Pervo dates uh, uh, Luke and Acts, especially Acts very late, way too late, I think. Uh, Luke is keenly interested to show how the Christian church and the whole story that unfolds links up in various ways with with Roman history, and he's he mentions certain people who are in office and when they're in office and so on. He seems really interested in that. And where does the book of Acts conclude? It ends uh, probably in the winter of 62 or something like that, winter, early spring of 62. Paul finally, through shipwreck and misadventure, winds up finally in Rome. But later in the year, James is uh, killed in Jerusalem. 
And, and of course, Josephus talks about that because it leads to the high priest, Annas Jr., being removed from office. Um, why doesn't Luke mention that if he is writing uh, considerably later? There's the fire that destroys a, a large portion of Rome. Nero blames Christians. There's this great pogrom against the Christians. It's very likely that Paul and Peter during this time die. Um, uh, Nero uh, k- kills himself uh, in uh, in 68. We have a lot of turnover of Roman emperors, and, and it's very disheveled. Uh, then you have the destruction of, of uh, Jerusalem. You have Vespasian's triumph and success. You have his triumph, his celebration in 71. Vesuvius buries Pompeii and Herculaneum in 79. That would fit in with with Old Testament motifs of earthquakes and so on. Well, let, this is rich history that's ignored, and that, that tells me, again, Luke Acts is probably early, not late. Well, that, that is exactly where I was going for my, my second question, uh, which is Luke Acts. Um, you know, there, there's a kind of, a, uh, you know, theory that because Luke doesn't mention, uh, in particular, the deaths of Peter and Paul, that it must, you know, it's likely to be written in, in 62 or 63 is, is what I've heard. Um so, uh, and, and, and then if we can assume that Mark is before that, then, then that might put Mark, well, before that. Um, so, Matthew, how do you handle the question uh, of Luke Acts? Uh, I mean, I, mean I, I, I learned it was commonly dated in the 80s or 90s. What do you do with the theory, though, that Acts doesn't record certain events that took place in the mid-60s and why those would have been left out if it's, in fact, written in the 80s or 90s? Yeah, so, I mean, it's an argument from silence, uh, which I think makes it a little speculative. Uh, one thing I will say is that while Paul's death is not explicitly mentioned in the narrative at the end of Acts 20, uh, they do uh, refer to Paul departing uh, for Rome, and they say that they will never see him again. Paul says they will never see him again. It appears to allude to Paul's death. It seems that the author knows that he's dead. Uh, at the same time, too, I don't think that Acts is necessarily writing a uh, history that goes up uh, to the present moment. Uh, and that's not uncommon among a lot of historians. You could ask, you know, why doesn't Herodotus write about the Peloponnesian War in the interceding years if he's writing close to these events uh, instead of ending earlier, several decades earlier? Uh, I think uh, the purpose of Acts is to prevent, present a narrative of how the Christian Church uh, grew out of, Ro- of uh, Jerusalem, and then eventually uh, reached Rome. Uh, regarding other details from the narrative, the, uh, the, the mention of the temple's destruction in Luke, uh, where it's possibly, and most scholars would argue, is uh, following uh, Mark's narrative, there's also references to being aware of armies surrounding the city. Uh, and some argue that this is not just a uh, vague reference. I mean, that, you know, Evan, uh, Dr. Evans talked about how Mark isn't given the specifics, but it seems that Luke's description he does actually refer to armies around the city in Luke 21, and so that might more specifically refer to the Roman uh, attack against the city. Uh, I also think um, that, uh, that there might be a, a chance that uh, Luke is using uh, Josephus, and that wouldn't place him as late. Uh, Dr. Evans says he doesn't think that 121 30, he thinks that's way too late. If he's using Josephus, that's more of after 93 or 94 CE. So that's not quite as late as he's, uh, as he's cautioning against. Dr. Evans, uh, you, you kind of hinted at this already in your first answer, but any, any other thoughts on Luke Acts? Sure. Yeah. Um, the uh, armies surrounding the city and some of these details, there are three or four um, distinctive eschatological oracles in Luke. Uh, he rewrites some material he finds in Mark 13. There's some stuff that prob- could be Q-related. Uh, there's some other stuff that seems to be unique to Luke. And C.H. Dodd, long time ago, noticed that it doesn't appear to reflect the details of the destruction, but rather there are phrases taken from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. There are phrases taken right out of, uh, out of the prophets. And I thought that was a very interesting observation on Dodd's part in the Journal of Roman Studies. And I think that's something else that needs to be taken in. You know, like Paul says, you won't see my face again. To go back to that, I think, in his farewell speech to the Ephesian elders. And I, I think what, what this means uh, is that Luke knows Paul's in prison. He's not at all sure Luke 
that Paul will ever get out again at the time he's writing. So that's not a, uh, not a strange uh, statement there. So these kinds of things, scholars wrestle with them, and we try to figure out what makes the most sense. Nobody really has proof. It's always a question of probability. So what Matthew has suggested, you know, that's, that is, it's plausible. It, it could be right. But I think as the, uh, the evidence mounts, it starts to tilt again away from such late dates because there's just too many juicy theological things that could be exploited, but we're not. Mm. Let's uh, do a, do a very very brief cross examination. Uh, so Matthew, I think we've got time for one question each. If, if you've got one question uh, for Doctor Evans, and like I said, we can go beyond an hour uh, if if y'all would like uh, a little bit anyway. Uh, but but Matthew, have a question for Doctor Evans, and the Doctor Evans, you'll have a question for Matthew. So go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, I think actually instead of posing a question, I'm going to maybe respond to some of his points, and then he can respond to me. I, I kind of. Okay, Want that's to, fine. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. So uh, one thing I will say about uh, the reference to the pray it doesn't come in the winter in Mark uh, being vague and uh, that being an indication since it happened in the summer uh, that it wouldn't uh, occur. Um, so I talked with Adam Wynn about this, and what he basically argues is there's actually a scene transition before that. Uh, he argues that in between Mark 2 and verse 3, they go to the, the Mount of Olives, and Jesus is talking to the disciple, and in that he asks, uh, the disciple says, when will these things, tauta, Greek plural, happen, rather than tuto, this thing, namely the temple's destruction? And what he argues, actually, is that verses 14 to 23 are not referring to the destruction, but are referring to the coming of the Son of Man in the end times. Um, likewise, another point I'll make, and then I'll give it over to Dr. Evans, uh, is that I think it's not just... John Evans mentioned that there were other Jews that made prophecies of the temple discussions. He noted uh, the de- temple construction. He noted the Essenes. Uh, he noted other examples. Um, what I would say about that is it's not just Jesus who I think is predicting the temple destruction in Mark. I think the actual author is, and it's because of the anti-temple motif in 11 through 12. Mark is thematically arranging material like the withering of the fig tree to serve as a metaphor for the temple itself. And so I don't think just Jesus is making the prophecy. I think Mark is making the prophecy. And I think the best reason why is if he's writing after the, the, during the reign of Vespasian, the temple's on everybody's mind because Vespasian is using a lot of propaganda to discuss the destruction. That's my view, and so I'll give it to Dr. Evans. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a very good point. I do think that Mark the Evangelist has woven together uh, created sandwiches, which is mar- the way Mark and scholars usually uh, talk about it. I think most of these, and for our audience, what I mean is there's a, there are two stories that are blended. One is cut into two, and then the other story is inserted in the middle, and so it creates the sandwich effect as though there's a piece of meat between two slices of bread. And so the the fig tree is found to be fruitless. It's cursed. Jesus then takes action in the temple precincts. Then then the, the fig tree is found later, and it's it's dead. And so you are right. I do think it goes together, and it suggests that the fruitless fig tree reflects a fruitless and doomed temple establishment. These are the things, these are the kind of things prophets do. And uh, it's lives of prophets. Josephus uh, himself predicts the temple's destruction, or so he says, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and one or two other pseudepigraphal texts uh, clearly uh, anticipate the temple's doom, worried about Gentile presence, worried about a corrupt priesthood, testament of Moses written probably in the year 30 or so, anticipates disaster because of a corrupt priesthood. And I think that's what's going on. So <clears throat> for Mark, the the problem is, is Jesus has been rejected by the Jewish authorities, the religious authorities. He's been rejected by the priesthood. That doesn't look good. That doesn't commend Jesus or the Christian movement. So he's casting Jesus in the role, a role that very likely Jesus played, which is why he went to the cross, uh, of condemning a corrupt and avaricious and oppressive priesthood, not the Jewish people, not Judaism as, it's, as, 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 as such, but a corrupt priesthood. That's why he's popular with the people. And Mark, I think, reflects very well uh, the pre-70 realities in Jerusalem involving the general public. And so as the Jewish war gets underway, if we date Mark in 67 or 8 or something like that, uh, he very likely edits with the anticipation that these things will come to pass and soon. 
Well, with that, we'll, we'll bring our first topic to a close. Uh, again, you're listening to, if you found us here on uh, KPFT.org, you're listening to the Sin Boldly radio program. If you're wondering why it's called Sin Boldly, just Google Sin Boldly, and you'll see Martin Luther's fabulous quote about how it is that we live in a fallen world. But uh, again, uh, check out KPFT.org if you find us on the podcast. And uh, if you're listening live and you want to listen to more shows like this, or listen to this one again, as I'm going to, with Bible and maybe Josephus in hand, uh, you, can, you can just go to our website at the church, felchouston.org, and uh, find the link to iTunes and the podcast there. Um, okay, uh, by the way, uh, maybe we could do another show one day on the, on the dating of Hebrews. Uh, I've heard uh, dates on uh, that book anywhere from the mid-50s, and interesting theories about who the author of that was, uh, all the way up, of course, into the 80s and 90s. So I think that'd be an interesting topic, too. But we're going to stick to the Gospels today. And uh, topic two, then, is how does the dating of the Gospels affect their historical reliability? And just as a very brief word of... of um, of introduction, um, you know, I think typically the earlier the dating, the, the more historically reliable we superficially believe them to be. Uh, so that that's kind of the import here. And so on that question, how does the dating of the Gospels affect their historical reliability? Matthew will go for six minutes, Dr. Evans will go for six minutes, and then we'll have about ten minutes or so uh, for back and forth. So uh, Matthew, take it away. All right, how does the dating of the Gospels affect their historical reliability? I think that there are two major questions that need to be asked when addressing that. Uh, first, uh, there's the question of how long does it take for things to be made up, for legendary material to creep into the narrative? And the answer to that, I think, is not long at all. We have plenty of examples of antiquity and legendary material being invented quite rapidly. Uh, Alexander the Great, for example, was said to have visited legendary Amazonian warriors uh, by sources being only a couple decades after his death, such as on Secretus, uh, who even was a traveling companion of Alexander. The 6th century CE life of St. Genevieve was, claims to be written only 18 years after the subject's death, and yet it includes things like calming storms, raising ships from the sea, performing exorcisms, etc. However, uh, what all these examples show, in my view, is that it doesn't take long for people to invent stories, uh, especially if you're writing to praise the deeds of a particular hero or individual. Uh, simply being written within a few decades of Jesus' death, therefore, does not mean that the Gospels are historically reliable for everything they report. In fact, uh, James Crossley was brought up by Dr. Evans previously, and as he noted, uh, he claims that Mark may have been written as uh, late, as early, I'm sorry, as the late 30 CE, uh, around 40 CE. But uh, Crossley argue, also argues that the empty tomb in Mark at the end of the narrative is a fabrication from the author. So he thinks Mark invented that with only about a decade. So it doesn't take long for things to be made up, but the second question I think we should ask is how long does it take for things to be forgotten, for all historical memory to disappear? Uh, here it's important to note that the Gospels date within a century of Jesus' lifetime and not several centuries later. This means that the historical evidence for Jesus is not the same as people like Theseus, Romulus, or Moses. They don't have any sources for their life within centuries. Uh, there's too big of a gap uh, for any uh, memories or eyewitness testimony to survive. Uh, although... Um, the gap between Jesus' death uh, is considerably smaller, and though, although it was transmitted orally, we still are within the lifespan of second and third generation eyewitnesses, uh, and we don't have that for people like Romulus. So the dating of the Gospels, I think, makes a serious case for them preserving some accurate historical information about Jesus, but we have to sort, the problem is we have to sort through the embellishments. So here I'll outline a number of issues that I think affect the Gospels' historical reliability. Uh, first, the Gospels are not independent accounts, but are interdependent upon each other. Matthew and Luke are large amounts of material from Mark, and I also think that John was familiar with Mark and Luke, but even if we grant Johannine independence, the text would have still relied on common source materials of the Gospels, perhaps a passion narrative. Uh, then we don't always have this interdependence for other figures. Uh, take the philosopher Socrates, for example. We have independent sources for him, Aristophanes, Xenophon, Plato, who are not just borrowing and redacting material between each other, Another problem is that the gospel is that they make a large amount of claims that we can't independently corroborate. Uh, we don't have any outside sources, for example, who record things like Herod slaughtering infants in Bethlehem, or the ripping of the curtain in the Jewish temple. You can say, as some apologists do, that simply because no evidence like this survives, that doesn't mean that it didn't exist. Uh, but there are also literary and mythical explanations for why these stories might appear in the gospel. The slaughtering of the infant echoes Moses being put in a basket. The ripping of the temple curtain serves as a symbol that man's separation from God has been removed. We thus have non-historical explanations for why these details might be included. 
Another problem is that we only have Christian sources for most of the details in the Gospels. Even if non-Christians like Tacitus or Marabar Serapian mentioned a Christ or a wise king, when Christians worship, they don't necessarily corroborate the extraordinary claims in the Gospels. Uh, likewise, there are Christian sources before the Gospels who don't really don't necessarily corroborate their claims. We have the Apostle Paul's letters. Uh, and those are written in the 50s or 60s CE. And Paul references things like Jesus having a brother named James. He mentions Jesus' teachings on divorce, but we can't really use Paul to corroborate a lot of the things in the Gospels. It might be that the, the opportunity never came up in the letters to mention them, and that's why they're not there. But at the same time, the state of the evidence doesn't allow us to use Paul to corroborate many details. Uh, it's also important to remember that we don't have any sources that, date, uh, that all of our sources for Jesus date to after his lifetime, and they were all shaped in the memory of his death and the belief in his resurrection. Consider an alternative situation in the case of Socrates. Socrates is written about by the contemporary comedian Aristophanes in the clouds, and what's interesting is that he makes fun of Socrates for asking annoying questions and studying things in heaven and beneath the earth, just as Socrates is depicted in later literature after his death. So we know that these details weren't fabricated about Socrates because we have contemporary sources. But what about Jesus? Uh, for example, when Jesus says in the Gospel of John, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Did the historical Jesus say this, or is it a theological invention used by a later author? If we had a contemporary source discussing some of these things, we might know they weren't embellishments, but with the state of the evidence, uh, we can't know that. So what we are left with, then, are four texts that are all dependent upon each other, either directly or through common sources. They appear to make embellishments and extraordinary claims, and yet we can't cooperate these claims through independent forms of evidence. That means we need to put a lot of trust in the Gospels. We have to rely on them. We have to rely on them alone to believe many of the stories about Jesus. And I think when the Gospels can be shown to be inventing things, like modeling Jesus off Moses and making him perform feeding miracles and walk on water, or modeling Jesus off Elijah and having him ascend to heaven, we don't need to assume that historical events produce these claims rather than literary and theological embellishments. So while I think that there are certain kinds of accurate historical information in the Gospels, such as real cities and real people and probably kernels of what the historical Jesus taught in his ministry, I do not think we can take these texts at face value. Instead, we have to approach them with a great deal of caution and acknowledge that there are, we have limitations in what we can know about Jesus, especially for stories that depend solely on the Gospel tradition. With that said, I will now turn it over to Dr. Evans. Okay, okay. Hey, well done, Matthew. That was, a, once again, a very fine summary uh, of the, uh, I would say, the range of, of views on this. And um, first of all, you, no one should approach the Gospels if one is trying to be a, uh, a historian and not simply <clears throat> someone who's a, a confessing Christian who, for, for a theological or apologetic point of view, says, I'll just accept everything. But as historians, critical historians who sit down and ask for reasons, ask for sources, ask for good arguments— your, the approach you're taking has a, a lot of merit to it. There's no question that the gospel writers are telling the story very much with, with uh, typologies in mind, some of them you mentioned uh, in the Old Testament, with Old Testament language and phraseology, vocabulary in mind. I already touched on some of that when I was talking about Luke. That's very true. The Gospel of John is itself an interesting genre question. Is this really, uh, sh should it be understood as the historical Jesus who is saying this, the synoptic Jesus, as it were, uh, saying word for word these things? Or do we have a blend of drama, a blend of Jesus as wisdom incarnate mixed with a reminiscence of the historical Jesus? Scholars re wrestle with that. But if I limit myself to the synoptic Gospels, there are a lot of things uh, that encouraged me to think that you 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 conceded there are some details, there are some kernels, I think is how you put it, that go back to Jesus, and I agree. The question is, is which kernels, uh, how many of these kernels do we really get the essential story? And I think we do. At the end of the day, we do have uh, a, a distinctive character that surfaces critically sifted, even if we set aside as unprovable or uncorroborated a number of things, do we have kernels that go back to Jesus? And, we, and I think we have to agree. And do we have the distinctive Jesus showing up in these kernels? And I think we do. The Jesus who says things about God, who alludes to himself as son of man, who uh, e exhibits authority, uh, a, a person whose deeds and sayings impress the crowds, uh, even his enemies uh, concede that he's a powerful wonder worker, although they want to uh, slander him and say, oh, you know, you're in league with the devil. That's how come you can do these things. So the date, so I'll go back to the original question. <clears throat> 
How does the dating of the Gospels affect their historical re- reliability? Well, on the one hand, it is a factor, uh, as, as you acknowledge rightly. But on the other hand, it depends on the quality of the sources that have been picked up, not so much when they were written. So if Matthew is written in 75 or 80 or Matthew is written in 65, the real question is, uh, how good are the sources that Matthews used? How good are the sources that Marks used? You mentioned the interdependence. That's another good observation. But that's where we get multiple attestation. We're able to see that some things are in two or three independent streams. But when Matthew uses Mark, that's an endorsement. When Luke uses Mark, it's an endorsement. When Matthew and Luke share Q, and it overlaps a little bit here and there with Mark, uh, one could see that as confirmation and endorsement. In other words, it's good material. It's not eccentric and odd material. And so those are all factors too. But for me, at the end of the day, verisimilitude is the key. Verisimilitude, and I, I'm not explaining this to you, Matthew, because you know this as a classicist, but verisimilitude means that the historical source exhibits the realities of the time, real people, real places, real events, real topography, real geography, and so on. Uh, verisimilitude, uh, we we recognize it because it's there's corroboration from other sources. It fits. There's corroboration from archaeology and so on. If the gospels were unreliable, if they basically were just myths and fiction with a little bit here and there that might go back to Jesus, a handful of kernels, but nothing else. I don't think archaeologists would use the Gospels. And, and that's my one of my pastimes, going to Israel every year and digging with the archaeologists. And what's so interesting is you can be Jewish, you could, you could be a, a non-Jew, you could be a Christian, you could be an atheist, you can be, as long as you're an archaeologist, and there you are digging, they always use Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You could look at Jim Charlesworth's edited collection of studies, Jesus and Archaeology, 31 contributors, eight of them are Jewish archaeologists. Uh, some of these people are Christians, many are not. And then you look in the index, and over a thousand times they quote and make use of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts. And uh, the Gnostic Gospels are never used. Why do they do that? It's because of verisimilitude. The uh, canonical Gospels are seen to be reliable sources. It doesn't mean they think that they're inspired or inerrant or authoritative. They just discover that, you know what, these things are accurate and it's worthwhile using them. You'd be, you'd be lost without using them. We know where to dig and we know how to interpret better what we dig up. And so that's why I, I view the Gospels as reliable. Now, if we have the, the real Jesus showing up in the Gospels, then you take the next step and you evaluate that. Is he really who he says he is? Is he really significant? Is what he says about God? God, the truth, now you're taking it to another level. That becomes far more spiritual. That becomes far more subjective. I would say that's at that point, it's really between you and God when you start looking at what Jesus says and you start evaluating that. Is there an existential truth here that applies to me? That's a whole other question. But I, I believe that the Gospels do tell us what Jesus taught and the kinds of things he did, how he impressed himself on on his contemporaries, friend and foe alike. Well, okay, that's uh, each of your six-minute take. Um, I'm, I think I've got two questions, but Dr. Evans, uh, you you, uh, you addressed, uh, I think, my, the main parts of my question. But, uh, Matthew, this will give you an opportunity to come right back on that. And my, my question is this. Uh, regardless of when we dated the Gospels, although... I, I, my second question is going to deal with Luke and his, his four-verse prologue, uh, uh, all important, of course, uh, him sp- claiming to speak to eyewitnesses and so forth. But before we get to that, um, do the details of the Gospels give them credibility, regardless of when they were dated, regardless of whether the authors lived within the lifespan of eyewitnesses or their sources were eyewitnesses. I mean, one of the things, and again, Matthew, if you accuse me of bias, you'd be totally right. So uh, this is where you may be at a uh, pastor's hosting the show. So um, so I, I, I'm not claiming perfect objectivity here. But when I read the Gospels, and especially Acts, I am just amazed at the level of detail and the correspondence and agricultural practices, religious practices, labor practices, uh, the names of people that were at meetings, um, you know, where people were from. So even if they were written in 90 or 100, if we just looked at the details alone, 
Um, where does I mean is it is it possible that that has more weight on their reliability than than when they were written? Okay, I think it's important to stress which details we're looking at. I think some are more reliable than others. Uh, Dr. Evans mentioned there is similitude, and he says there's a consistent character that comes with Jesus. I think to a limited degree that's true. I think the Gospels do depict Jesus in different ways, uh, occasionally contradictory. Uh, but at the same time, I think there are some minimal details that come out about Jesus, that he was from Galilee, that he was an itinerant a prophet, uh, that he predicted a coming kingdom of God. I don't doubt that. And the things that I tend to doubt more are, I think, embellishments that were built on Jesus uh, using motifs from uh, texts like the Septuagint, modeling them off of Moses, modeling him off of, off of Elijah. I can believe Jesus was an itinerant prophet, but not necessarily believe those details. Uh, the other thing that's uh, come up is the, the issue of archaeology. So, for one, I'm not entirely convinced that just because uh, a text refers to accurate archaeological details is necessarily correct. Uh, Homer's Iliad uh, did refer to an accurate city of Troy, and Heinrich Schliemann was able to even use that text to excavate to find the city. So, I mean, that is a very big archaeological discovery. Uh, but it's from a myth. Um, at the same time, too, the way the Gospels rearrange each other, the, the narrative, the, the what order of events, did Jesus cur- uh, purge the temple uh, right before his death in Mark, or did he do it several years before in, in John? I think that you can have real settings and real people, but you can still adjust the material in ways that puts it out of chronological order, uh, that might even remove historical context. And you can also have, I think, uh, embellished stories being told in real places, but... Dr. Evans also pointed out that uh, the, the canonical Gospels are more reliable than the apocryphal Gospels, like the Gnostic text. And I agree, and those sources are later, um, and they are outside of the, the geographical, the, 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 uh, the ethnic context that Jesus originally lived in. So, I mean, sure, I'll grant that, uh, that the Gospel of Judas uh, is not necessarily a reliable historical text or something like that, but I still think that there are problems with the canonical Gospels. Okay, Dr. Evans? Well, I would never deny that uh, there are no problems uh, with the Gospels. It's a good thing there are. I wouldn't have a job. (laughs) This is what we uh, as scholars do. And uh, Matthew, I I wish you the very best as a future classicist. You're going to be, you know, you show me some mastery of text already. I'm impressed. And, uh, you know, you have multiple accounts of certain things that various Caesars uh, did and and you get the same kind of uh, chronological discrepancies. One of the things I teach my students is we have a modern bias, which I'm not saying it's bad. We want things in strict chronological order. We want uh, words verbatim. If, if we say, you know, President Obama said something, then we want it word for word. We're not interested in paraphrase or interpretation. But that's not the way it was 2,000 years ago. That's not the way Jesus taught his own disciples. He taught them to be interpreters, not parrots, not mimics who simply repeated his words. Uh, as he says, in, uh, you know, at the, after some parables, he asked his disciples if they understood him. They say yes. He says, well, then that's the way it's supposed to be with a scribe who's been trained or discipled uh, for the kingdom of heaven. He knows how to dig into the theology box, the treasure box, and pull out and pull out new stuff, not just old stuff. And I, that's the way Jesus taught his disciples. And the problem, as I see it, and this is what people like Bart Ehrman and some others are reacting to, is you have a naive fundamentalism that's taught and assumed by lots of Christians, and that's unfortunate. And they take a modern understanding of how history ought to be done, and they read it into the past, and they assume the Gospels reflect that, and they're very dismayed when it turns out when people like you and me come along and say, you know, that actually isn't right. There are some chronological dislocations. Uh, Jesus has, in fact, been paraphrased here and there. He's been interpreted here and there. The real question at the end of the day, though, is this the real Jesus? Is this what he ultimately what he taught and did? And I think the Gospels do tell us accurately what he taught and did. And you're left with the freedom of saying, well, I'm impressed by that. I'm going to embrace that, make it part of my life. Or you can say, no, I'm not interested in that. I'm going to push it away and, and go somewhere else. In the, yeah, in the end, I think um, at some point we're, we're, we're going to come to some spiritual um, decisions uh, or, or, or ideas or what, what have you, um, not just textual questions. But let me get to the question of Luke. Uh, very famous passage, of course. Um, I'm sure you both probably have it memorized in Greek. Uh, but let me just read the first four verses of Luke because 
how the dating of the Gospels affects their historical reliability, I think that we would say, well, um, you, you know, if, if, if eyewitnesses are available, that's the best. Uh, that's the, that would be the, uh, probably the best uh, source material available. So Luke writes to begin his Gospel, and of course uh, he writes uh, something similar to begin Acts, or at least we know that Acts is his because of how he begins Acts. But uh, he writes, "...inasmuch as many have undertaken uh, to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty uh, concerning the things you have been taught. So Matthew, what, what do you think about Luke um, specifically mentioning the fact that he points to eyewitnesses. Is that something we can take at face value, or can he still do that in 80 or 90 or whenever you might date Luke? Okay, well, I'm going to uh, address that by first uh, raising some important points about that prologue. First off, that's a very unusual set of verses in Luke. And if you look at the style of the Greek in those verses, it's a very rhetorically polished, periodic uh, sentence arrangement. The rest of the Gospel of Luke uh, follows a form of Greek that's much closer to the Septuagint, it's closer to the other Gospels. So I think we shouldn't treat those first uh, verses as indicative of the entire genre of the text. It's also weird that the author uses the first person, I, Theophilus, in writing this text to you. As Armand Baum has pointed out, that uh, is not typical of the other Gospels. Matthew and Mark don't even use the first person, and John doesn't use it quite in the same way. Uh, and one thing that's true about Greek historiography is that typically the authors, even if they didn't name themselves, would interject with things like, it seems to me, and so forth like that. There's, the first person comes up. The other thing is that while Acts has this kind of historiographical, semi-historiographical prologue, if you look at the narrative of the text, it seems to follow literary patterns that are more common actually in novelistic literature. Uh, Richard Pervo has an article on the use of direct speech in Acts. Um, and your speech is when you quote actually what someone says. So you say, I am the word and the light, versus Jesus said that he was the word and the light. That's indirect speech. Uh, it tends to be a feature of historical narrative in Greek and Latin literature that they actually use indirect speech. They don't like to give the exact words, or when they do, they'll use constructions like toyade. They put words like these. Uh, they will use, there'll be subtle ways, and you have to really read the original languages to pick this up, but the author will distance themselves from knowing the actual words that were spoken. But Acts actually has about 50% of the narrative in direct speech. Uh, and Perko mm. found that there was, a, that, that's very common in fictional literature. I'm studying the Alexander Romance and the Ice of Aesop right now. They have a lot of direct speech. Um, and likewise, historical narratives don't. The closest that came was uh, the was Salus de Bella and Catalina. And uh, that's not really a good text to use because there's a ton of orations in it. It's not really the same dialogues. But to address the issue of eyewitnesses, uh, there's some dispute about whether he's talking about directly using eyewitnesses or whether the, he's using tradi tra traditions handed down by eyewitnesses. But I would say, actually, the narrative uh, constructions of Acts creates more issues. If he's using eyewitnesses, I don't think he's using them the same way that historians like Herodotus and Herodotus do. I think he's actually telling a much more novelized and dramatic narrative. Okay. Well, I knew I was opening a can of worms with Luke 1, and we could probably do a whole uh, whole show on, on those four verses. But, Dr. Evans, you wanted to come back on a couple of points. Uh, just a couple of points. Um, Luke, uh, he uh, he's following a pattern that we actually see in um, uh, Josephus, for example, in, in uh, Appian, two books, where uh, he begins a similar way, where in the I person, I, in the first person, he introduces each of the two books. Uh, uh, Philo does the same thing in Life of Moses, uh, Vita Moses. He, it, you know, there are two books there, and it, it, it's very similar. So Luke fits in more of the Judeo uh, Hellenistic, Hellenistic Judeo. Uh, climate in terms of genre. He's not really an odd man out there. So to introduce introduce his work uh, in the first person and then go on and give it in a more conventional third person narrative is not strange. The, another uh, indication of eyewitness testimony uh, is the we sections in Acts. And I know scholars interpret that in a lot of ways. But I think the simplest explanation is best here. Paul really was a traveling companion 
with Luke in some of his journeys. Then a second point I want to make, you were talking about Luke's use of uh, sources. Perhaps he depends on Josephus, and yes, Richard Purvo and others have suggested that. I have a major problem with that. Luke's use of known sources is plain and obvious. His use of Mark, it's obvious. His use of Q is obvious. His use of the Septuagint, and of course, there he, you know, he may be using other sources, but they're not known to us, so it isn't obvious. But we have Josephus. There's where has he quoted Josephus? Where do we have a single sentence or a phrase? And so the idea that he's used Josephus, uh, it just is. That's a possibility, but it's not in step with his known and observed practice. And so I think we should be careful about assuming that just because you get some general parallels once in a while between Luke, Acts, and the Greco-Roman world about which he's writing, that doesn't mean he's used uh, Josephus as a source. Well, we are just about at the end of our time. I think we can go a little bit long, uh, maybe just five or ten more minutes. Um, Why don't we have one more question from each of you, then closing statements, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. So, Matthew, do you have a question for Dr. Evans? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so you mentioned uh, that Luke's prologue echoes historiographical literature, and, and you noted people like Josephus and so forth. And so I'm curious uh, what you think of Richard Curvo's study of direct speech in Acts. I mean, he compares the amount of direct speech uh, in the narrative to novelistic literature, or like the Alexander Romance. This is an interesting example. The Alexander Romance has about 30% direct speech, whereas Plutarch's Life of Alexander, an historical biography, has about 10% direct speech. And you see a difference uh, based on how they're arranging who, who's talking. And I think that difference points to the fact that Acts is some, and depicting it uh, in a more um, novelistic way and having it presented as a scene a dialogue as opposed to reporting uh, information that he's learned from sources. So what do you make of the direct speech in Acts? Okay, that's a very good observation. I think there's no question that uh, Luke, uh, and, in, and in his own way, the fourth evangelist, uh, are using some, dr- some dramatic uh, touches that you do see in novels. Uh, one of my doctoral students recently uh, did some very interesting work on that very theme, talking about the Gospel of Peter. And so I think that uh, there there are, not, you know, I mean, the novel is a relatively new invention, literarily, in the first and second centuries. And so, you know, there we are again, 2,000 years later, we think of novel, we think of fiction, we think of history, and it has to be written a certain way. But 2,000 years ago, those lines weren't drawn. And uh, to be rhetorical, to be entertaining, to be riveting, these were all f- uh, f- uh, features that authors in antiquity were experimenting with. So I'm not surprised if we get some elements like that. So I, I don't dispute what you're saying, but I, I think I would be inclined to uh, come to simply a different conclusion about the implications of these observations. And, and a question for Matthew, and then we'll do closing statements. Well, yeah. <clears throat> you know, Matthew, uh, let me ask you a real simple question. When do you think you'll be finished with your Ph.D.? <laughs> so this debate happened at a really rough time for me. I'm working on my perspective this quarter. I anticipate having a defense in a couple of weeks. I might have to go to the next quarter. After that, I got uh, two years of guaranteed funding. I'll be working on my dissertation, uh, maybe doing some work studying abroad. Uh, but so two to three years, I'll be finishing the PhD. Okay, that's excellent. I wish you every uh, every good luck in that. And uh, I'd I'd be delighted if you stay in touch. I'm doing some work myself with some colleagues on uh, where the New Testament literature intersects with classical literature and the classical world. So uh, please, please keep me informed of your progress. Okay. Um, Would would y'all like to make a closing statement or two? Or Matthew, Matthew, would you like to? Um, You want to, uh, Dr. Evans? Well, I I think this kind of discussion is something that people need to hear. It's a it's a world that's not just biblically illiterate. And I'm referring to the church, not just to people who are outside the church. They don't know history either. Uh, they don't know the classics, 
And so the more people like you and me talk about these things and air these things, and I, I sure hope it encourages people not just to open up the Gospels and read them for many people for the first time, but that they are interested in related literature too, the classics, uh, many of which you've alluded to. I think that's very important. We need a better educated a world. It's it's a postmodern society that's largely illiterate. That that distresses me. I'm sure it concerns you too. So this is important work, and I think it, it has an educational value. Good. Okay. Let me make my conclusion. I know we're going way over, uh, so I'll try to make this as succinct as I can. Uh, first off, let me just thank Dr. Evans for his very generous and very kind tone, and I think we've had a, a wonderfully convers- you know, constructive conversation. I hope more debates about the, the New Testament will be like this. I'll summarize my final case as uh, succinctly as I can. Uh, For one, we've talked about, we started off talking about the role of the temple in uh, the Gospel of Mark and how it affects dating. I think uh, that Mark has a Gentile audience. Um, I also think that there wasn't a sign of anti-temple rhetoric in pre-Markan sources. So it seems to me that uh, the, the, the temple is very important. It's very important that the temple of construction is alluded to. Um, and I think the most the way to make the most sense about this is why would people care about three chapters of talking about the temple's destruction? I think the best answer is that it's produced in the wake of the Emperor Vespasian destroying the temple uh, and after 70 CE. Uh, a few other things I'll talk about. Uh, Dr. Evans noted that the, uh, there's multiple attestation between the Gospels. Uh, one thing I will say is that uh, the Gospels are much more inter- interdependent than you can than other classical sources you can look at. Take Tacitus and Suetonius, for example, they narrate uh, many of the same periods, the Julio-Claudian dynasty, uh, the Flavian dynasty, and Dr. Evans notes there are some chronological differences between them, but there's a major distinction here. Suetonius tells us he's not arranging material chronologically, and Tacitus does goes out of his way to follow a year-by-year pattern, so they are actually cluing us in the more stuff. And actually, Tristan Power has a recent article about how Suetonius and Tacitus are probably genuinely independent. Uh, I certainly think their independence can be shown better than the Gospels. And yes, Tacitus and Suetonius cooperate a lot of the same material, but the Gospels appear to have to rely on each other oftentimes, and sometimes they relate uh, contradictory material. Uh, for the references to the Wee Passages in Acts, I'll just refer people to a, by a work called, by William Campbell called The Wee Passages in Acts of the Apostles. Um, he makes the case uh, against whether or not there's there's eyewitness testimony there. Uh, The last two things I'll say is uh, the direct speech issue. Dr. Evans said this is a modern construction, not an ancient one, uh, that there weren't these understood divisions between genre and antiquity. But I think Pervo's study actually disproves that, because he shows that actually if you take ancient literature, solely ancient literature, and line up the amount of direct speech, Acts is, uh, is, you know, along the same lines as the novelistic literature and no historical literature, Plutarch, Salas, Tacitus, the Cephas, Polybius, none of them have as much direct speech as Acts. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, Dr. Evans mentioned uh, Bart Ehrman and the naive fundamentalism that causes people to uh, lose faith. Again, I'm, uh, I'm an atheist, I'm, I'm secular, I don't, uh, I believe Jesus existed, I believe there are limited amounts of uh, historical material in the Gospels, and so I think you can, uh, you can learn that just by studying ancient history. And what I will say, though, is that I think while we do get a cohesive picture of Jesus as an itinerant prophet. I don't think that many of the extraordinary claims about him, walking on water, ascending to heaven, things that appear to allude to Moses and Elijah, I don't think we can prove those things historically. And at the most, what we can show historically is, yes, there was a real prophet Jesus walking around Palestine in the first century. Well, I'm grateful that you say that, because I'll be debating somebody in a couple of months in Georgia, and he doesn't think Jesus existed. So in my debate, I will refer to you, Matthew, as a supporting voice of reason. Thank you. <laughs> well, no mythicists here, so uh, so so far we're, we're in agreement on that. Well, as always, we're going to have to leave uh, some, uh, some ends loose. Uh, we can't possibly cover every uh, facet of, of this interesting conversation, but certainly the dating of the Gospels has uh, taken a—from uh, from just, you know, I'm no expert in this matter, but in, in the middle of the 20th century, I think— Late dates were were really all the rage, and and they seem to be getting later and later. And what I've observed in the last five or ten years is that more and more scholars seem to be dating 
earlier and earlier and earlier. It seems like the move is uh, earlier. So Matthew is uh, working hard to rebuff that trend. And Dr. Evans, uh, we appreciate your scholarship. Matthew, I certainly appreciate your time. And like Dr. Evans, I want to wish you all the best in your PhD studies. I hope we can keep in touch. We're Facebook friends now. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I hope we can keep in touch and do this again on another topic. And we'll, we'll give you some time to uh, get through a very busy uh, phase of your, of your life. And um, Matthew, could you just tell everyone uh, your your website uh, or websites quickly? Yes, I have two blogs. Uh, one of them is adversusapologetica.wordpress.com. Uh, it's a site that engages in Christian apologetics from a secular perspective, but works to not be anti-religious as opposed to providing secular alternatives uh, to apologetic arguments. The other is civitashumana.wordpress.com. I it's a separate blog where I write about uh, secular humanism. I keep it separate from my history blog. I like to distinguish my historical work from my, uh, my work in philosophy, and particularly the philosophy of atheism. And so I encourage both believers and non-believers and people of other religious faiths uh, to read it. And Dr. Evans, it's Craig A. What's yes, <clears throat> my uh, web page is craigaevans.com. All right, good deal. Well, thank you both very much. We're going to have to call it. Uh, call it a day there. Uh, Matthew, stay on the phone for one minute, all right? Uh, but until next time, friends, uh, check out kpft.org. You can learn more about the Sin Poldley podcast at felchouston.org. And until next time, may you have the peace that passes all understanding. See ya.